afternoon and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name is Randy Hollerith and I'm the Dean of the Cathedral. And on behalf of Bishop Marianne Buddy, the Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today. For those of you who are wondering, what does it mean to seat? What does it mean to install? What are we doing? Are we looking at uh, washers and dryers here? What's going on? <laughs> So let's start with our wonderful chaplains. Mm -hmm. Chaplain Kibben and Chaplain Black have two of the most important ministries in this country, with the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And there are seats in this cathedral for the two chaplains who hold those positions. To seat them in their stalls, as the old term goes, is to honor them in the best way that we know how as a cathedral, to call them members of our community, friends of respect, and those we stand with in their ministry. So it is an honor to have them both with us this evening. And then John Meacham has been a wonderful friend to this cathedral for many years. And we are honored to, ins to install John as the first canon historian of Washington National Cathedral where John will use his gifts as historian and the legacy and, and the uh, insights of history guided by the, the illumination of the Gospels and the ethic of our Christian faith to be in conversation and dialogue. And so we're honored to have John fill that very first role here at the cathedral. Friends, it is a joy to be with you this night. May we begin in earnest with our opening sentences from Scripture, grounding us, focusing our eyes on God. We give thanks to the Father who has made us worthy to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. O oh Lord, open thou our lips.
reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Romans 12, 921. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay any evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. A reading from the lesson, letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Thanks be to God.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us salvation. O Lord, save the state. with righteousness. And has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow thy blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys which thou hast prepared for those who unfeignedly love thee. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee in the Holy Spirit liveth and reigneth one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Lord God, 
whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, triumphed over the powers of death and prepared for us our place in the new Jerusalem, grant that we, who have this day given thanks for his resurrection, may praise thee in that city of which he is the light, and where he liveth and reigneth for ever and ever. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for thy love's sake. Let us bless the Lord. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please. In his final song, Moses stood once more before the people of Israel. The promised land lay in sight, the future was at hand, deliverance was only steps away. And yet the great prophet spoke then not of what was to come, but of what had been. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will tell thee, thy elders, and they will show thee. Of what had been. Like Moses, we believe in remembrance, not remembrance in the sense of sentimentality, and least of all for nostalgia, but remembrance as an act of witness and as an act of agency. From the first Passover to the Last Supper, our ancestral faith is rooted in that remembrance, in acts of commemoration, and in a recognition of the sanctity and the dignity of every individual human life. Such principles animate our faith when it is at its best, and they animate our nation when it is at its best. The common denominator is all of us, we the people, for both our faith and our nation thrive when each of us manages, however briefly, to transcend our frailties and our failings, to live in closer harmony with the ideals of love and of light. And there is nothing harder the story of that perennial struggle between hope and fear is the stuff of history. It's the story of seeking to love what's genuine, to hate what's evil, and to hold fast to what is good. It is a story with all too few heroic hours and all too many disappointing ones. But we must try, for only in trial is progress possible. And only in trial can we discover whether in fact we can run and not be weary, walk and not faint. I am honored that the bishop, the dean, and the chapter have asked me to play this role. I thank Chaplain Kibben and Chaplain Black for their service to God and country. I thank Speaker Pelosi for her leadership in democracy's hour of maximum danger. 
My children, I should note, do think that my becoming canon historian is likely to turn me into the Admiral and Mary Poppins, wandering around in costume firing off artillery. But I already do, so at least it's official. Here we are. I don't need to tell you that we are living in an hour of crisis for our country. Crisis comes from the Greek. It means the hour of decision. Hippocrates used it to describe the moment when a patient lives or dies. That's where crisis comes from. Ours is an age of declining trust and growing extremism, the spread of lies and the erosion of truth, and the primacy of an impulse for brute power over a dead and a deadly dearth of compassion and of neighborliness. And this isn't hyperbole. It's the raw, discernible, inescapable fact of the matter. It's not partisan, it's self-evident. And here's something else that is a fact and should be self-evident. From the beaches of Normandy to the rending of the Iron Curtain, from the passage of Social Security to the creation of a safety net, from Harriet Tubman to Alice Paul to John Robert Lewis, we are at our best when we build bridges and not walls, when we act out of generosity, not greed, and when we lend a hand rather than point fingers. In such moments, America gets much right, and honesty compels us to admit that America gets much wrong. How could we not? Democracy is the sum of its parts, and we, the sinful, the selfish, the self-satisfied, are those parts. I, for one, am all of those things. I'm a sinner who falls short of the mark again and again and again, every hour of every day. I know better. I know better from the sacred scripture of my faith, the secular scripture of my country, and yet I fail. And I'd be willing to wager that some of you might fail on occasion too. We won't have a accounting, but I'm just guessing that maybe one or two of you think the same. But we endure, and we endure because we're driven by a hope that we might one day prevail. And for all of our manifold failings, as creatures of God, we are taught to remember, remember, that we too can overcome the darkness. And there is so much darkness to overcome. A lot of folks who look like me aren't all that eager to acknowledge that American history is a mix of good and of evil. We would prefer to hear the trumpets rather than face the tragedies. But face them we must, for an honest accounting of who we've been can enable us to see who we want to be. Progress in America is almost always slow and bloody and painful and provisional. The Civil War led to segregation, the New Deal to right-wing reaction, the Civil Rights Movement to white backlash, the presidency of Barack Obama to the corrosive politics of fear and of insurrection. We must acknowledge the truth of that past and of our present, no matter how painful it is. We have to acknowledge it because it is painful. We have to confront reality in all its anguish and complexity because that is our reality. We must remember that history calls on us to close the gap between the profession of the ideals of equality, justice, and love, and the practice of those ideals, because that is what our best history is. And in answering that call, one, as St. Augustine said, is ever ancient, ever new, we must bear in mind that the moral utility of history, the moral utility of remembrance, is not to congratulate, but to challenge ourselves to hear and heed the still small voice of conscience, to heed and to hear the whispers of God, to hear and to heed 
the importuning of the angels, to hear and to heed the summons of duty and of humanity and of love. To me, history can be an illuminating conversation between the living and the dead with the goal of improving the lot of the yet unborn. And to know that we have met and solved seemingly intractable problems in the past should give us hope for years to come. So what can we learn from that past? That the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. That compromise, principled compromise, is the oxygen of democracy. That our common life must be about the mediation of differences, not the waging of unrelenting war. What is true in our own lives, yours and mine, that we ought to love one another as we love ourselves is equally true in the life of the country. Now, religion and politics have the most complex of histories, but they are inextricably linked, for both are about the human enterprise. Religion in Washington, D.C. is a complicated story. President Eisenhower was once busy, had a particularly busy cabinet meeting he came in, he launched in, 20 minutes in, he said, Jesus Christ, we forgot the damn prayer. This happens. These are problems. He was a Presbyterian, so we forgive him, you know, um, can't have everything. Sorry, Dean. I just, the first time I ever got in a pulpit, I was, just as I was getting up, my childhood rector grabbed me by the hand and he said, please, just lose no annual givers. So I'm, I'm doing what I can here. One of the great achievements of the American founding was the assertion and defense of religious liberty, which very much includes the right not to be religious at all. But I do believe that a totally secular public square is an impossibility. And our task is to manage and marshal religious belief in the service of liberty and of democracy. We are enjoined by the psalmist, remember, to put not our trust in princes. And the New Testament teaches us that all nations are of one blood. The duty of the Christian then is not to force one's beliefs on anyone else, but to bear witness by living as best we can in accord with the gospel. A gospel founded on the counterintuitive conviction that the first shall be last, and that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. There's nothing more counterintuitive than that. And these are also the motive forces of democracy, which is also counterintuitive and incredibly fragile. Democracy, remember, is the exception in human history, not the rule. If this were easy, everybody would be doing it. Democracy only succeeds when we choose, and it is a choice, to give as well as to take, to love each other as we love ourselves. But the story of humankind from the Garden of Eden forward suggests that most people would rather take than give. It's easier. Democracy then, like faith, is forever vulnerable, yet it is also forever possible if we heed the lessons of our faith and of our history. And our faith and our history tell us this. From Seneca Falls to Selma to Stonewall, from Lexington Concord to Gettysburg to Omaha Beach, we have moved the world toward liberty and away from tyranny. The future belongs to the men and the women in power and far from it who insist on giving all of us what Lincoln called an open field and a fair chance. And how do we know the future belongs to those people? The people who rejoiced in hope and were patient in suffering? We know that because the best of the past belongs to those who did precisely that. We honor John Lewis. We do not honor Bull Connor. We honor those who build. We do not honor those who tear down. 
and perhaps history itself, perhaps remembrance itself, may offer us a path forward through the wilderness of the world if we define history as the story of the American Odyssey from limitation to possibility, from exclusion to inclusion, from constriction to opportunity. And in that history, in that history, through the mercy of God, lies our hope. Bishop Mary Ann, it is our purpose this evening to install a canon in this cathedral church. Let the presentations be made. I present to you John Ellis Meacham, layperson in the Church of God, who has been chosen to serve as canon historian in the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul. I believe he has demonstrated competence and faithfulness and has been prayerfully and lawfully selected. Thank you. John Ellis Meacham, layperson in the Church of God. You have been elected by the Cathedral Chapter to serve as canon historian of the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul. As such, you have been called to share in the leadership of the Cathedral's ministry at the direction of the Dean of the Cathedral and under the authority of the Bishop of Washington. Having committed yourself to this work, do not forget the trust of those who have chosen you. Care alike for young and old, strong and weak, rich and poor. By your words and in your life, proclaim the gospel. Love and serve God's people, nourish them, and strengthen them to glorify God in this life and in the life to come. And may the Lord who has given you the will to do these things give you the grace and power to perform them. Given under my hand and seal in the city and Episcopal Diocese of Washington on the seventh day of November in the year of our Lord, 2021, and in the 10th year of my consecration. John, do you, in the presence of this congregation, commit yourself to this new trust? I do. Will you underta undertake this task faithfully, putting your trust in God alone? I will, with God's help. Will you work together with the chapter and the canon, College of Canons to carry forward the mission and ministry of this cathedral church, boldly proclaiming the work and the word of God in Christ? I will, with God's help. To the congregation gathered, I ask, dear people of God, will all you who witness this new beginning support and uphold this ministry? We will, with God's help. Receive the Holy Scriptures and this prayer book, and be ever mindful in all your counsel to promote the well-being and the mission of Christ Church.
receive this medal in recognition of your exceptional leadership and as a sign of the collegiality with your fellow candidates. Let these symbols be signs of the ministry which you share with me, with the dean, and with the canons of this cathedral church. As Bishop of Washington, I do hereby induct you, John, duly and lawfully elected as canon in the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, with all the rights, duties, and privileges, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As Dean of this Cathedral, I now invite you to take the stall symbolic of your office. Almighty and eternal God, so draw my heart to you, so guide my mind, so fill my imagination, so control my will, that I may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you. And then use me, I pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends, I present to you our new canon historian.
Bishop Marianne, it is also our purpose to seat the chaplains to the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate this evening. Let the presentations be made. I present to you Margaret Grun Kibben and Barry Black, Presbyters in the Church of God, as chaplains to the United States House and Senate to be seated in their honorary stalls in the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul, conceived as a great church for national purposes. As chaplains to the Houses of Congress, they keep us mindful of God's presence in our midst and help us to remember that divine source by which we and all the people of this land are strengthened and helped. Friends, you have been invited to be seated in this cathedral church. As such, you have been called to share in this cathedral's ministry to the nation through times of great celebration, sadness, and uncertainty. Do you, in the presence of this congregation, commit yourself to this new trust? I do. Will you undertake, undertake this task faithfully, putting your trust in God alone? I will, with God's help. And dear people of God, will all you who witness this new beginning support and uphold this ministry? We will, with God's help. Receive the Holy Scriptures and be ever mindful in all your counsel to promote the well-being and the mission of this nation. Receive these tippets as signs of the collegiality with you and the canons of this cathedral church. Let these symbols be signs of the ministry which you share with the community of this cathedral church. As Bishop of Washington, I offer you these honorary stalls appointed to your offices as Chaplain of the United States House of Representatives and Chaplain of the United States Senate. May the Lord stir up in you the flame of holy charity and the power of faith that can overcome the world. Amen. Amen. As Dean of this Cathedral, I now invite you to take stalls symbolic of your office. Remember us, O Lord, as you have in ages past. You made the world and our human race. You shaped its history, correcting your people with judgment, yet with love. We thank you for this, our United States of America, for its liberty and freedom. Give us grace to carry out your work 
and send your blessing upon those who are in our care. For your mercy endures forever, and we give you thanks, for you alone are good. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Friends, will you join me in greeting and thanking our congressional chaplains? My brothers and sisters, we are the body of Christ. Let us endeavor to keep the unity of spirit in the bonds of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Maintaining social distance, let us share a sign of peace with one another. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence. Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things that were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Go forth from this place in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Remember that the Holy Spirit working in you can accomplish far more than you can ask for or imagine. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this night and always. Amen.